Uh, hello and welcome everyone to our weekly reading session of the Bitcoin of Tech newsletter. And today we'll be uh, reading through newsletter number 281, published on 13th of December. Uh, most of you who uh, attended the previous sessions of our weekly reading are aware of the format of the session. So I'll uh, directly uh, dive into the newsletter. Uh, the newsletter primarily consists of like the latest news and happenings in the world of Bitcoin and, and changes to services and client software, certain selected questions and answers from the Bitcoin stack exchange and uh, releases and release candidates and uh, notable code and documentation changes. So basically it's, it's like a summary of uh, what's happening in the world of Bitcoin. Uh, so we commence with the news that they have to share with us. Uh, the news is the discussion about briefing liquidity ads. Bastion Tentier posted to the Lightning their mailing list about a potential problem with time locks on dual funded channels created from liquidity advertisements. This was also previously mentioned in recap number 279. For example, Alice advertises that for a fee she is willing to commit 10,000 sats of her funds to a channel for 28 days. The 28 day time lock prevents Alice from simply closing the channel after she receives payment and using her funds for something else. Continuing the example, Bob opens the channel with an additional contribution of 100 million stats, that's one Bitcoin, of his funds. He then sends almost all of his funds to the channel. Now Alice's balance of the channel isn't the 10,000 stats she received a fee for. It's almost 10,000 times higher than that amount. If Bob is malicious, he won't allow those funds to move again until the expiration of the 28 day time block to which Alice committed. A mitigation suggested by Tatia and discussed by him and others was to only apply the time lock to the liquidity contribution, example only Alice's 10,000 sats. This introduces, this introduces complexities and inefficiencies, although it may solve the problem. An alternative that Tatia uh, proposed was simply dropping the time lock or making it optional and letting liquidity buyers take the risk that provides that providers may close channels shortly after receiving their liquidity fees. If uh, channels open through liquidity ads typically generate significant forwarding fee income, there would be an incentive to keep channels open. So just uh, let's let's uh, discuss this uh, this piece of news. I'll I'll share like uh, what I have That's to it. share. What insights I have to share. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you are discussing it, great. But I had a small confusion in here wherein it mentioned that you know Alice's balance in the challenge channel uh, sort of rises up from 10,000 sats to 100,000, 100 million sats and like and so those all that fund will get logged for the foreseeable time. I, I did not understand that part. So if you can elaborate a bit on that, it will be great. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll go through it. This is something that even I, I was slightly puzzled about. I'll share my understanding with you. Okay. So uh, and anybody who ever sees uh, PPs, please see the channel. So basically, uh, this uh, news article talks about uh, primarily dual funded lightning channels and liquidity advertisements and a uh, potential problem in them and uh, Bastion 10 to years solution to it. So uh, in, in short, like what are dual funded channels? We're all aware of what single funded lightning channels are. Single funded lightning channels is what we use, what are primarily used where one of the two channel partners unilaterally provides liquidity to a lightning channel. Out of the two channel partners, it's only one channel partner that uh, sends a funding transaction that broadcasts a funding transaction from which inbound liquidity is derived. But there's also an alternative being explored referred to as dual funded lightning channels where both the channel partners have a skin in the game. Where both the channel partners commit inbound liquidity to a lightning channel. And um, there's this concept of liquidity advertisements which is also being explored. Now what happens in this case is that uh, if a node has space stats and they are willing to lease those stats to a dual funded channel for a certain amount of time in exchange of lease fee, they can advertise it. So if Bob has let's say 10,000 stats spare and Bob wants to lease those 10,000 stats to a dual funded lightning channel, Bob can advertise that. And if Alice wants to open a dual funded channel and she wants to search for nodes that are willing to lease her stats uh, and become partners on a dual funded channel and she's willing to pay a lease fee for that, then she can search for these uh, these these liquidity providers in a P2P liquidity market. 
So it's basically an avenue, liquidity markets are a P2P avenue where buyers and sellers can meet together and establish dual funded channels where uh, both the partners provide uh, liquidity. One is the buyer, the other is the seller. And what the seller gets as an incentive is A, leasing fee and secondly, uh, the routing fee. So what happens is now the potential threat that uh, is talked about is the fact that it's possible for the seller to submit inbound liquidity and uh, take a lease fee and after that disappear or, or submit a commitment transaction and close the channel unilaterally. In this situation, what happens is that the buyer gets duped because the buyer has paid the lease fee, but the buyer has been cheated by the seller. So to prevent that, a CLTV, that is uh, a relative time lock is applied to the inbound liquidity supplied by the seller to protect the buyer from getting duped. Uh, now, what Bastian Atenturia mentions is that he believes that not the buyer, but the seller is more worthy of being protected. If you, if you go through a post that he has posted in the Lightning Dev mailing list, or if you go through the recap, it's like very, very long. Uh, if you go through that, uh, he argues and he advocates the case that the buyers are the one that needs to need to be, the sellers are the one that need to be protected and not the buyers. And the reason that he gives is that the sellers generally, if in any market, when a buyer buys from a seller, the buyer does his due diligence and, and does a research about the reputation of the seller. So if anybody is taking inbound liquidity from a node, they will do their due dil diligence. They might use watchtowers or a network topology to see the reputation of that seller. And only if they're convinced with that seller, will they pay him a lease fee. Whereas the buyers in most cases are anonymous nodes. So the sellers are the ones that deserve to be protected. And that is why there should be no time lock. The buyer should be forced to take a risk of paying the lease fee and getting inbound liquidity. And then if the seller like, like cheats, it's, it's the buyer that loses, but the buyer is the one who should be at risk. One thing that Sepu also mentioned is something that puzzled me. And I went through the entire post in the lightning dev mailing list. And I also went to recap number 297. This is something that has puzzled me as well. Where he says that now Alice's balance is, is 10,000 times higher. Uh, because the balance, uh, as far as I believe in the lightning channel is, is like, this is clear that, uh, I mean, Alice has 10,000 sats. Okay. Uh, and then Bob has a uh, hundred million sats. So what Bob does is that Bob sends all those stats to Alice. So Alice's balance is now 10,000 times higher. That's understood. And, uh, but what even was it about is that how does it, it bother Alice, whether her 10,000 sats are locked for 28 days, or whether 1.1 BTC is locked for 28 days, like her inbound liquidity is locked in any case. So this is uh, this particular argument of the author is something that even I was puzzled about, and I was not able to to figure out why he makes this claim. So if anybody has uh, any input, uh, they can share it. What what do you think would be the reason, and, and how would you explain this this passage? So in my understanding, uh, and this is like. Please correct me if I'm getting it wrong, but in my understanding, the channel that Alice might have opened and might have committed uh, 10,000 sats uh, because uh, on the other end, Bob does not have a certain, like Bob's commitment is not mentioned. The channel capacity might be, you know, a couple of hundreds of millions, can be, can be a couple of hundreds of millions. And if Alice were to get some denomination uh, because the channel capacity is so huge, uh, Alice can potentially uh, get 100 million sats or uh, if Alice has another uh, route open and there's uh, this hash time locked uh, sort of transaction flowing in through Alice Bob's channel, uh, potentially like a lot of sats can be can come at Alice's end uh, either because Alice was the end recipient or because Alice happened to be in the node uh and uh, and in in both the cases like if if she was the end recipient uh, she can actually not withdraw because like her end uh i don't know how how this exact implementation is done but it's being suggested that the implementation is such that all the funds at her end will be locked for 28 days uh in the current implementation irrespective of whether she gets something or not that's what my understanding is but not exactly sure if uh, why that is the case or if that's the case. Yeah, but I mean, like, what what I am puzzled about is that whether her ten thousand sats are locked or whether one point one BDC is locked. 
like how does the amount make any difference alice cannot use those funds she cannot submit a commitment transaction and retrieve those funds on the main net in any case so her 10000 funds are anyhow locked and she cannot retrieve them okay yeah so like maybe i can uh, give a shorter explaining this so yeah first of all uh, let's talk about griefing attack so what is a griefing attack a griefing attack is a kind of attack in which um, the attacker is not incentivized in any way to do that attack but he like does that attack uh, at a cost and then like he doesn't gain anything from that cost but uh, he just tries to disrupt the network and cause harm to like other nodes or other people so that's basically what a griefing attack is and in this example in Paragraph 2 what they have done is that so Bob is malicious and Alice is honest Alice has committed 10,000 chats for 28 days and Bob has committed one BTC which is like 100 million chats for uh, for opening a channel so then what Bob does is that Bob transfers the entire liquidity like through payment routing or something to Alice's side and now the uh, now the Alice's side of the balance will be one BTC plus uh, 10,000 chats and then the then Bob won't allow uh, funds to flow from Alice's side to Bob's side, which is the whole point of the Lightning Network. The Lightning Network is to like support to and fro Lightning fast payment. It's not like uh, just send a, a big amount to one side and you uh, you sit and wait there. So uh, uh, Bob can reject okay. routing requests from Alice, and the total liquidity log for Alice now would be. Um, one BTC plus 10,000 sats. Mm-hmm. And that also deprives Alice of routing fees, right? If Bob refuses yeah. to, to uh, yeah. So yeah, but we, like routing fees is very small. I don't think uh, that's a big issue, but uh, because Alice has logged, like she committed 10,000, but now she has logged one BTC plus 10,000. So that's, that's the main right. issue. And she can't uh, like take the funds out of the channel because of the 28 days time lock. So the, so the purpose in this attack is mainly to to harm the the lightning network. Yeah, the yeah that's basically what a griefing attack is, and there's no incentive for Bob to do this. He's not like earning anything or uh, gaining anything through this attack. He's just trying to uh, like lock Alice's fund and yeah do some damage. To the right, network. right. Because if, if Alice would have uh, created a funding channel with somebody else, those ten thousand chats would have gone to and fro and would have helped the network grow. But now they're of absolutely no use. Yeah, not just ten thousand chats. So if you transfer the entire balance to Alice's side, Alice has logged like over one BTC, and she right. can't withdraw that. Right, until right. Until the twenty-eight days time lock expires. So yeah. Right. Great. Great. Thanks, man. So if uh, anybody has anything else to add, any observations or insights, then please uh, feel free to go ahead, else we can move on to the next section. Yeah, I think in the discussion it was mentioned that 10 Turing has also suggested that there's a way to just time lock the 10,000 sats that Alice has, Alice like that, that belongs to Alice, and not lock the other one BTC, which does not belong to Alice, but that has a lot of complexities. Uh, and sh- I mean, uh, so if, if there's any like, if this is simpler explanation of what sort of complexities there might be, that would be great to discuss. I know that's beyond the scope of today's Optech newsletter. Uh, yeah, so that's um, what I wanted to ask. Cool. Yeah, so like I haven't read like uh, Tiva's proposal for how to do that, but I think it might have something to do with splicing in and splicing out. So maybe if uh, Bob does this kind of attack, Alice can, Alice can spice out like all of the funds except. Uh, those 10,000 but yeah as you mentioned the implementation complexity is that would be huge to understanding yeah that's great so we're moving on to the next section right nothing else to share we move on yeah Fazil. yeah fine. so next section talks about the changes to services and client software in this monthly feature, we highlight interesting updates to Bitcoin wallets and services. So the first one is Stratum V2 mining pool launches. Uh, its demand is a mining pool built off of the Stratum V2 reference implementation, initially allowing for solo mining with pool mining planned for the future. 
so um, what I have to share is that basically demand is a mining pool company. Uh, okay, and uh, Stratum is is like a mining protocol that uh, connects solo miners with mining pool operators, and its upgraded version that is referred to as Stratum V2 is being explored. Now this this uh, this Stratum V2 uh, reference limitation uh, claims uh, to be uh, like uh, introduce a lot of uh, security benefits and, and privacy enhancements, reduce latency. Uh, on the website, there's a documentation which you can go through in which they have like uh, listed uh, almost a dozen uh, benefits and upgrades that it has over the previous version. A couple of them that I found really uh, noteworthy, I'll uh, share them with the participants. Uh, one upgrade and enhancement feature that Stratum V2 uh, claims to have over Stratum V1 is the uh, referred to as job negotiation protocol. Now in Stratum V1, it's uh, the, the pool operators that decide unilaterally what transactions are going to be included in the block. Uh, what this uh, does is that uh, this uh, increases the chances of censorship because uh, I mean the mining pool operators are not anonymous, these, these are known people. So if anybody wants to censor a certain transaction or a transaction ID, it's pretty easy for someone with authority to, to uh, just reach that mining pool operator and like force them to uh, censor that transaction. But what uh, Stratum V2 proposes is that it's the solo, uh, it's the solo miners that will have the option to choose which transactions will be included uh, in the block, and it's an opt-in opt-out option. Like any any mining pool that is willing to opt into this feature can advertise that, hey, we have this feature. Now we're allowing the miners to choose what transactions are to be uh, included in the block. And uh, the miners also have an option to opt in whether they, they want to choose the transactions or they want to let the, the mining pool operators choose the transactions. Now, what this does is that this increases decentralization because the, the solo miners more or less are geographically dispersed and anonymous. It becomes much more difficult for someone with authority to censor transactions uh, if it's the solo miners that are determining what transactions will go in the block. Now, what exact mechanism, process, what exact negotiation or algorithm will be deployed to determine which miner will propose the transactions for the entire mining pool? How will the miner be chosen? Was not mentioned anywhere in the documentation or in the internet, but it's just proposed that the the solo miners will have the option to choose what transactions will go into the Bitcoin block, thereby enhancing the decentralization of uh, mining operation as a whole. And they're referring to this feature as job negotiation protocol. And another thing uh, that was pretty noteworthy is uh, another feature which is uh, in Stratum V2, which is reduction in bandwidth consumption. Now, Stratum V1, uh, it, it like uh, transmits uh, the messages to and fro from the solo miners to the pool operators in the form of JSON objects. And what uh, Stratum V2 reference does is that it transmits messages over the network between the solo miners and the mining pools in the form of binary, thereby reducing the size of data exponentially. And what this does is that this reduces latency because uh, for miners latency is, is of uh, like, it's a highly important thing because the moment a block is successfully mined, uh, the miners should be immediately informed, like every second matters to them so that they, they can immediately start mining another block. So what this does is that this reduces latency so these two features that i discussed the first one has like a huge incentive for the for the mine the solo miners and for the community as a well whole because it decentralizes uh the mining operation and the second is that it reduces latency thereby incentivizing uh, uh the miners as well so that they get to know immediately when a block is mined. uh this is what i have to share what i covered pertaining what demand is and what starting to references demand is a mining pool company that claims that they have uh, now built or they are planning to build a uh, mining pool operations based on Stratum V2 reference which will leverage the benefits of the Stratum V2 software. If anybody has like any insights, any questions, anything to share there, then please feel free to go ahead. Else we can move on to uh, the next one. Yeah, I think uh, then, sure. this was self-explanatory. So uh, I, I, I mean, you did a good job over there, uh, but I think we can move on to the next one. All right. Um, the second one is uh, Bitcoin Network Simulation Tool Warnet announced. The Warnet software allows for specifying node topologies, running scripted scenarios across that network, and monitoring and analyzing re resulting behaviors. So, um, what uh, like a Bitcoin Network Simulation Tool is? It, it basically allows you to simulate the behavior of the actual Bitcoin network 
it is primarily used by researchers, developers, educators, etc., to to uh, run, simulate a Bitcoin network. And uh, like, if you want to test a feature in a controlled environment that you propose to be implemented in the main net, it gives you an environment, a controlled environment where you can see how the Bitcoin network will will behave when this feature is implemented. It's not specific to Bitcoin. I'm sure most people who are into software know what's a what's a simulation tool. You can sim simulate a lot of environments. And so you can simulate like uh, wallet nodes, you can simulate mining nodes, you can test different features. So like there's a new software by the name of Warnet, Warnet software that has been launched and uh, this allows uh, researchers and developers to simulate the, the Bitcoin network and test different features. Okay, uh, so uh, the next one uh, we can cover if we have, I mean, uh, after every uh, news article, I won't stop and ask you all if you all have anything to share. If you all have anything to share, just, just pop in, okay? Yeah, so um, I was wondering uh, if anyone is aware of other competing uh, solutions uh, for Wordnet. So I know there are net, there are network analysis tools, uh, for example, uh, the simpler ones, which just tells you uh, about the blockchain, uh, like how, how, how filled they are, what is the VB, I mean, sats per byte that's going on there, or you know, uh, what which kind, what particular transaction happened in which, which particular block. So that there are a lot of tools out there. Uh, do you have any idea as to how Warnet is like more advanced or different from these ones? Uh, I think so. Yeah. What you are referring to, yeah, sure. On what piece? Okay. Yeah. So. Um... So what say to what you're talking about, those are like block explorers basically, and mm. they allow you to like explore the current Bitcoin network. Mm. Warnet is different as in, uh, it would allow you to run, um, hundred or 200 nodes on your laptop in rest test mode, and then, uh, like explore various network topologies and see how the nodes interact with each other and like visualize the whole network as a whole. And there's no other tool out there that does this okay so like and it you like run it only in to... reg test mode or can you run it in like uh, the production oh. environment as well no no i only re rest test but otherwise like how would you like why Simulate. would you want to run it in on mainnet yeah because in mainnet there's only one truth it's only in reg test yeah, that yeah. and, get and to see. like the cost of running uh such a tool on mainnet would be very high hmm. so yeah it's not very economical and like it doesn't make sense. So like, uh, one of the things that, uh, uh, Warnet would help us do is like, uh, simulate soft forks and see how it affects the mm. network. So for example, if only 50% of the nodes accept the soft fork and 50% don't, then what would happen and like try to simulate some of the attack scenarios that can happen in Bitcoin. So, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Thanks Anmol. That's a great example. And that's a wonderful use case that you uh, mentioned and uh, a soft fork, how the network would yeah, behave yeah. in case of a soft fork because there's always so much of speculation uh, before a soft fork. You can run these demos and figure out like after 50 blocks or 100 blocks, probably the network will yeah. have picked up a winner or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you can do like all kinds of uh, simulations of this. Yeah, a really great tool. I think like Matthew Zepkin was working on this. Nice. Okay, so uh, the next one is a uh, PayJoin client for Bitcoin code release. The PayJoin KLI is a Rust project that adds command line PayJoin sending and receiving capabilities to Bitcoin code. And this is also pretty self explanatory. Most of us uh, you know what PayJoin is. It's, it's basically a mechanism that makes Bitcoin heuristics tasks uh, like more difficult. In, a, in, in like a, a stereotype transaction, there's a sender and there's a recipient and it's a sender that unilaterally adds funds to the transaction. What PayJoin does is that it also allows the recipient to add an input to the transaction thereby making life for people who are monitoring uh, the network to, to deprive the network users of privacy, make their life different, difficult, I'm sorry. So that is what PayJoin is and uh, it mentions that the PayJoin CLI is a Rust project that adds command line pay join sending and receiving capabilities for Bitcoin code. So this pay join facility has now been added to Bitcoin core via this pay join CLI, which is a Rust project. Uh, next one is uh, call for community block arrival timestamps. A contributor to the Bitcoin block arrival time data set repository calls for node operators to submit their block arrival timestamps for research. There is a similar repository for collecting uh, stale block data. 
So these guys have posted a tweet. I just went through the tweet and they have a oops, we'll go through the tweet. It's a very small tweet, bit bitmex research and they say if we can we will write a report on this topic in the coming days based on the time gap between when uh, each block was first seen by the folk monitor or info servers and the block time stamp. So uh, these people have actually I think asked node runners to uh, submit their block arrival time because there's a latency between the time stamp in a block and the block arrival time. The block arrival time varies from might vary from node to node because once a block is mined due to latency and transmission of data, there is a slight lag between the actual uh, time stamp in the block that is mined and the block arrival time of each node. So uh, these people have asked for node runners to submit their block arrival time and the primary reason that they want to do some research. I think this research is, is what is the, the latency in the in the time stamp of the blocks and the, the block arrival time of individual nodes. If anyone has an old debug.log of an always on node going around, feel invited to donate your block arrival timestamps to GitHub. So this is the only use case that I can think of that they are trying to figure out what's the latency and what's the difference between the timestamp in a successful block and uh, the time at which this information reaches each node. Anybody else can think of any use case why, why they are uh, gathering this data for what research, if anything else. I mean, maybe they're thinking of like some kind of attack vector regarding this, like uh, what if like blocks get mined too fast and like there are competing chains, like I don't know, I'm just speculating. Uh, another yeah. speculation that I had was like, uh, because it's up to the miners to enter the time field in the block and they, they have some, some, some ability to sort of yeah, yeah, modify yeah. that they are probably trying to see if uh, even within the range there are certain uh, sort of segments which are more likely to get them uh, a winning block that's a possibility based on like previous block which was accepted right 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 among that to me, as from my understanding that does make sense as well because they've not mentioned anyway why they want to collect this data so we can only come up with our own inferences so another one, good use case for warnet here and you can uh, use that to simulate this right to check the latency right yeah but like it won't actually uh like be relevant to the live network because like all of the nodes are running on the same machine so the network uh, latency would be um, pretty low but maybe we can like scale it up by a factor and then that could be helpful. Right, right. Thanks, thanks. Sir. Okay, and so the next one, next highlight is that Envoy 1.4 release. It says Bitcoin Wallet Envoy's 1.4 release adds coin control and wallet labeling, among other features. Uh, coin control here, I think, it refers to a coin selection mechanism. Right, coin selection is the method that a wallet uses to choose which of its UTXOs to spend in a particular transaction. Most early Bitcoin wallets implemented relatively simple coin selection strategies such as spending UTXOs in the order they were received first in first out. But as fees have become more of a concern, some wallets have switched to more advanced algorithms that try to minimize transaction size. Coin selection strategies can also be used to improve on-chain privacy by trying to avoid the use of UTXOs associated with previous transactions and unrelated. Uh, transactions. So primarily, uh, I mean, there's a Bitcoin wallet by the name of Envoy. It's 1.4 version got released recently. They've added two new features. First is a uh, uh, coin control, which is a mechanism of of choosing UTXOs. And I'll definitely, I mean, once I'm done with what I have to share, I'll definitely ask Anmol to to elaborate on this because he's also written an article, so he's like the right person to talk about this coin control mechanism and how it would be an added feature for uh, any wallet. And the wallet labeling a mechanism, I mean, this, I went through it, I'll just share. Uh, they have added a feature of wallet labeling. I mean, most of us that uh, use UPI payments know that uh, whether you're using any UPI payment, along with sending the payment, you have an option to add some metadata in the form of a text, which could be any information pertaining the transaction, the recipient's name or whatever, something like that. So a wallet label in a Bitcoin wallet looks like this. So if you're sending payment to someone, you can maybe mention the reason you do which uh, label label for your own use. You can maybe uh, mention the reason for which you're spending or or whatever information that you want to pass 
that we generally use in UKI wallets. So uh, this feature is also being added that along with the transaction, there's a there's a provision for you to add some text data that will be taken as a label with which you can reference any relevant information pertaining the transaction. Now this information will not be stored on the blockchain. This is only specific to the sender. The sender knows it and the receiver knows it. Okay. So uh, Anwar, would you like to add anything like on on point control and how it enhances like uh, uh, how it optimizes the the transaction fees? depending on how the wallet chooses uh, the UTX source to be spent. Yeah, so like, um, okay, so where do I start? So basically coin selection is the process how the wallet selects which UTX source to spend. So for example, if you have to pay 100 rupees to me, you can just pay me using 100 rupee note uh, in the fiat system and, or you can send, give me like 10 notes of 10 rupees. So like Bitcoin coins work in the same way. You you either spend the whole coin or you don't uh, like spend, you can't spend half of a coin. So coin control comes into play uh, here. So what are the certain use cases that you can optimize the first and the obvious one is fees and the second and most important one is privacy. So like uh, you, in Bitcoin, you have to pay fees for everything you have inside of the transaction. So if you have 10 coins and you can make the same payment using one coin, because uh, you'll have less inputs in your uh, transaction, uh, the one uh, input one would cost less than 10 input one. So you definitely save on fees. The privacy aspect of coin selection like uh, refers to, for example, if you have received multiple payments on the same address, you would like to spend like all the coins related to that address in the same transaction so that uh, transaction linking cannot happen. So like those are the two important things. But uh, apart from that, a good coin selection algorithm also helps you reduce the overall global UTXO set. So uh, right now, I think there are about 8 million UTXOs in the Bitcoin network and the overall goal should be to minimize the UTXO set because that's a burden that every node runner has to bear. So yeah. Right, right, great. Thanks, thanks a lot. And like okay. I'll, I'll briefly touch upon like uh, different algorithms that I use. So in Bitcoin Core, there are um, three algorithms that I use. One is uh, knapsack solver, and the other one is uh, single random draw, which uh, randomly selects UTXO, and the third one is uh, branch and mount. So like all these three generate uh, they uh, generate a possible UTXO set that can be used and there's something called a waste metric which is used to determine which uh, UTXOs, which selection would actually be used in the transaction and like waste metric is it, uh, is it so new, is this like whole new animal which um, basically compares the current fee rate to the long term fee rate. So like there are a lot of things which are going on behind the scenes when you actually build a transaction. So I'm definitely sure like adding coin control to any Bitcoin wallet would be a great addition because it would help you save the fees in fees. It would help you prove privacy and it would also help the overall Bitcoin network. Yeah, great, great use cases that you mentioned. Thanks a lot. Very well explained. Uh, Thanks. No, so the next one, the next one says BBQR encoding scheme announced. Uh, this scheme can efficiently encode larger files, for example, PSVDs into an animated QR series for use in A-gap wallet configurations. So, uh, my understanding of this is uh, that uh, there's only a certain amount of data that one QR code can comprise of. So when you're turning files into a QR code, there's only a certain amount of data that the file should contain for it to be converted into a QR code. And if you're converting a PSV into a QR code, uh, the, the size is, there's a possibility that the size might surpass the threshold for one QR code. So what this does, this, this BBQR encoding scheme does is that it basically uh, relays a, a set of uh, QR codes. It, it basically converts that file into a set of QR codes that is that are relayed one after the other. Like we have this concept of GIF, GIF images. Like it looks like a video, it's actually not a video, it's just a set of images that are being shown in quick succession. So you feel like it's a video. So it's similar to that and uh, we'll go through it. They also have an example. 
of how this QR code would look. So when you have data to share in the form of a QR code and the data is so massive that it cannot be uh, encompassed in one QR code. So these are like, I believe these are multiple QR codes passing one after the other, after the other, after the other in quick succession because one QR code in itself is not sufficient to contain that data of that massive file. That is what they always mention that the largest possible and compressed data payload is this uh, byte spread across one, two, nine, five versions, 40 QR codes. So this is kind of something. Would anybody like to contest or or affirm or add something? Yeah, like add, adding animation is really cool. And by the way, the coin kite, uh, the, the company that's developing is uh, are the guys behind Cold Card. So Cold Card is like one of the hardware wallets that you could use. I think they support this as well, right? Yeah. They support these QR codes. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. In Cold Card, uh, so the MK4 version, they, uh, you don't have a camera to scan codes. So like all of the things have to go through a SD card or NFC. Um, but uh, they are developing a new wallet called Cold Card Q. And it looks like really cool. It's like a small BlackBerry phone. It has QWERTY keyboard and all that. So I think they're developing this scheme for that. Okay, right. I I, I think I've, I've seen images as well. They've, they've also released the images or or uh, like some 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 of them for testing purposes or something. I think I, I've seen uh, that on social media. The images I've seen on social media. The next uh, version after the 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 Mark IV. So maybe that has this feature. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm I'm pretty sure that will have. And that the the camera that it has is only uh, able to scan like black and white QR codes. Mm. Right. So okay, these fine. are like these are assembly of like these are like very many QR codes bundled into one GIF. Each QR code representing a PSBT, right? No, this uh, is like I think this this is one chunk of data. Oh, so when you are scanning or the, when the camera is scanning, how does it know like what is the time duration between one uh, sort of scan to the next one to the next one? Is it like encoded? Uh, so like. It's it's is it fixed or maybe like time? yeah maybe they'll they'll make it part of a specification or something. Hmm. Okay. I think the device will understand that this is a QR code that yeah. it has to scan in a certain manner. Every maybe point two yeah. second or point yeah, two scan seconds. constantly for three seconds, five seconds, maybe a time or something like that till it it passes through all the frames of the QR code. Yeah, maybe just keep scanning, and if the QR code sort of gives you the same. Uh, address maybe discard it and if, if it gives a new one then accept it and keep accepting till you start receiving the same uh, previously accepted yeah. QR addresses yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's, cool. uh, let's move on to this one we have 15 minutes left uh zeus version 0 0.8.0 released the version 0 0.8.0 release contains an embedded LND node adding zero points channel support and support for simple tap root channels among the other changes. So uh, Zeus is, uh, I mean, it's a lightning wallet. Can anybody uh, chime in? It's, it's a Bitcoin and a lightning wallet, right? Yeah, yeah. I think they also support, uh -huh. it's, it's Bitcoin and lightning wallet. Yeah, yeah, yeah on, both, both on chain and off chain. Okay, so uh, yeah, so basically they've added this feature of uh, zero on channel support. Now, uh, basically, I mean, we were covering like me, Shreyan, and, and some guys who got together uh, to do the mastering, uh, mastering the Lightning Network session recently. We, we covered this uh, zero cons and multiple cons. So basically, when two nodes want to uh, uh, like it, uh, establish a Lightning channel between uh, the two of them, the initiator node basically sends the first message, which is like the open channel message. And this message is in the form of a JSON object of key value pairs which has the specifications or what you would refer to as terms and conditions that one node proposes to the other node and if the other node also uh, accepts he sends an accept channel a uh, message back now uh, one key value pair in this message that the initiator node sends is referred to as minimum depth so if alice wants to start a lightning channel with bob alice will send an open channel message to bob bob's node and notify that hey i want to open a challenge with you based on these terms and conditions and one of the term or one of the condition is known as minimum depth. So Alice will tell Bob that uh, my condition is that we will wait for X amount of confirmations for the funding transaction. So once the funding transaction is included in a block, it gets mined 
we will wait for x amount of blocks to be mined on top of that transaction till we consider the funding transaction to be final and immutable only after that will we commence with the lightning channel the standard is six that's the thumb rule that most people use but the two channel partners can negotiate if the two channel partners want to open up a lightning channel before waiting for any further confirmations the moment that our funding transaction is broadcasted it is included in a block it gets mined the two channel partners agree that we don't want to wait for any further confirmations we don't want to wait for any further blocks to be mined on top of this block we're fine with it we're good to go then they can just uh, uh, negotiate these terms and conditions in the open channel and access channel message and not wait any further for any blocks to be mined on top of the block that has a funding transaction this is what is referred to as a zero cons channel support i'll see if they have the uh, yeah so this is basically yeah, they, they don't wait for any any uh, further blocks to be mined on top of uh, the funding transaction so that's a feature that uh, this wallet has added and some support and support for simple taproot channels among other exchanges so yeah this is what i had to share and uh, in this section if uh, any observations any anecdotes then please feel free to share as we can move on to the question answer session quickly we have the 13 minutes with us okay fine so i'll move on to the question answer session and these question and answers have been had picked by the optic newsletter curators from bitcoin stack exchange so bitcoin stack exchange is one of the first places optic contributors look for answers to their questions or when we have a few spare moments to help curious or confused users in this monthly feature, we highlight some of the top voted questions and answers posted since our last update. We have 10 minutes, so I'll just go through them quickly. And if anybody wants to add, please uh, feel free to add. The first question is, uh, what are all the rules related to CPFP C-bumping? Peter Wheeler points out that contrary to the RBF C-bumping technique that has a list associated uh, policy rules, CPFP C-bumping technique has no additional policy rules so in short like uh what is cpfp it's, it's like child based for parent uh, so if, if there's the transaction that is languishing in the mempool uh, and not being included in a block because that has a very low fee and it does not lure any of the miners and uh, somebody has a child transaction that depends on the parent transaction with low fees then they can then broadcast the child transaction with a higher fees, thereby incentivizing the miners and luring them into including and mining both the, uh, the parent transaction and the child transaction. So this is what is referred to as child paying for parent. RBF is like replaced by P. Uh, it is another mechanism of incentivizing the miners. If you've uh, submitted a transaction, broadcasted a transaction with a low fee and the miners uh, do not feel free to include that transaction, then you can uh, send the same transaction with the same inputs, but with an increased fee, thereby incentivizing the miners and hastening the process of mining that transaction. So the question are asked, are, are there any rules related to CPFP? And uh, the answer is, the answer is by Peter Wheeler. Uh, the question is, uh, the answer is there are no specific relay policy rules that apply to CPFP because unlike RBF, CPFP is not a relay policy. It's a completely normal new additional transaction that gets relayed. The fee bumping effect is not achieved by a special relay mechanism, but by the miners block building any logic recognizing the combination of child and parent as better than the parent alone. For this work, uh, the block building code needs to be sufficiently powerful to recognize this. This is the case if the miner directly or indirectly uses Bitcoin Core version 0.13.0 later. Note that there are general policy rules that apply to dependent transactions, example the ancestor and descendant count limits which are by default 25 transactions they are not specific to CPFP but may impact its use. So what Peter Wheeler mentions is that there are no specific rules uh, for uh, CPFP uh, transactions for them to be included in a block but there is one rule that he mentions is that uh, and this is not specific to CPFP but that no transaction should have more than 25 ancestors or more than 25 descendants that is no transaction in the, the mempool should have more than 25 ancestors in the mempool or more than 25 descendants in the mempool that is unconfirmed ancestors and unconfirmed de descendants so if there's a CPFP that is trying to pay for the parent but it has 25 unconfirmed uh, ancestors then no matter how much fee you pay that transaction will not be uh, mined because it has 25 or more than 25 ancestors this is what we do we'll have to say that this is one thing that might limit a CPFP. Other than that, there are no specific rules. 
So yeah, so, uh, yeah. One small yeah. correction to what Faisal said. So you said that uh, that transaction won't be mined, but uh, in actually that transaction won't even get traded. Okay, it won't even because go to the mempool. Yeah, it won't uh, get into the mempool of other nodes because they'll just uh, just re- reject it because there are already twenty five uh, unconfirmed ancestors. Right. Right. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks. So let's go to the next question. How is the total number of RBS, RBF replace transactions calculated? Uh, Mark and Peter Vida walk through some examples of RBF replacements in the context of DIP 125 Zone 5. The number of original transactions to be replaced and their descendant transactions will be evicted from the mempool must not exceed a total of 100 transactions. Readers may also be interested in the add web 125 rule 5 test case with default mempool peer review club meeting. So what this question mentions is that uh, how is the total number of RBF replaced transactions calculated because an RBF is basically replacing by fee. So uh, how many transactions is an RBF replacing? What is the mechanism to calculate it? And what is like the upper limit? The so upper limit is 100 and how are those mechanisms calculated? So this is an example that the questioner puts forward that there's a transaction A and uh, that's a parent transaction for both B and C. So A is a transaction, A to B is a transaction, B to C is a transaction. If I use a transaction R that replaces both A and B, if R replaces A and B, that is uh, R replaces both A and B, then how many transactions will R actually replace? And uh, Peter Vida mentions that the rule implemented in Bitcoin Core today as of version 26.0 is that the sum of the number of descendants counted over all con- conflicted transactions cannot exceed 100. In your example, that number is 5. The descendant set of A is ABC. The descendant set of B is BC. If R conflicts with A and B, then those set counts are added up to are added up and R and 3 plus 2 is 5. Note that uh, this is the overest. Note that this overestimate only matters for determining the maximum conflict sex size. Once the number is calculated and verified to not exceed 100, the exact that is properly deduplicated conflict set is calculated. Set A, B, C in your example and used for further checks, including fee-based conditions. So uh, we will mention that in this case, if R replaces A and B. Then we say that R has replaced five transactions because the descendant set of A is ABC, the descendant set of B is B and C. Uh, anything to share? I, we move on. I had a question. So I'm not sure if I followed what a conflicted transaction is. So in this case, if uh, a transaction is replacing A, so it has uh, B and C as previous. Uh, transactions and in what exactly is happening here uh, no, so if a is replaced then uh, so b and c are uh, child transactions of a so if you replace a both a b c are invalid because uh, someone is pending b right. from a okay. right thanks okay. so the next one is uh, what types of RBF exist and which one does Bitcoin Core support and use by default? So this question, we just move quickly to the answer. Uh, the answer is mentioned that there are two types of RBS. That's what it mentions. Uh, opt-in RBF and uh, full RBF. It, it also sees first team state RBF. It's a proposal. If, does anybody has any idea whether this, whether this proposal has been implemented? And if it has been, then what does this imply first seen safe RBF or whether it's still just a proposal? Because I'm sure most of us know what's a full RBF and opt-in, opt-in full RBF. Yeah, I don't think like uh, this has ever been implemented because um, this can uh, cause conflicts within the network itself. So for example, if you re- received another transaction, uh, which according to you is safe to replace. And for me, I received another conflicting transaction, then yours, which I consider uh, safe to replace according to my mempool, then I think uh, that will cause a problem. So I don't think that was the reason why this was not implemented. Right, fine. So in, in practice, we have uh, opt in full RBF and we have like full RBF, which is the default. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. All right. Thanks. Go to the next one quickly. 
What is the block one nine eight three seven zero problem? We just go directly to the question. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, so uh, basically, from my understanding, uh, before the introduction of uh, BIP thirty four, which mandatorizes the inclusion of the block height uh, as a metadata while hashing the the Coinbase transaction to deduce its PXID. It was possible for two Coinbase transactions to have the same set of metadata that gets hashed, and it was possible for two Coinbase transactions to have the same EXID. However, this possibility was removed after the implementation of BIP 34. And there's also another BIP known as BIP 30, which verifies uh, the TXID of each transaction to ensure that no previous unspent transaction has the same TXID. Now, what he's referring here to as 1983702 problem. Is that this is a block that will be mined in the future, uh, but when you when you hash this block, its Coinbase transaction will resonate with it. it the TXID of its Coinbase transaction will resonate with one of the previous Coinbase transactions because the height of this block was used as a metadata uh, by one of the miners in one of the previous transactions. And I think they also give a list here of uh, the transactions that have this possibility. Uh, so these are uh, these are the transactions 1983702. This is the block, and I think these are the previous blocks with which this has happened. Like the TXID of the Coinbase transaction in 20921 was the same as 209920 and 4908971764. So this uh, basically talks about uh, the problem of this block that will come in the future that has a TXID of. Uh, a co whose Coinbase transaction has a TXID that will resonate with another block that has been previously made. So he talks about this problem. And uh, yeah, no, BIP30 I think is the only solution that uh, the answer, answer mentions because BIP30 validates the TXID of each transaction. BIP30 was, was not being deployed when BIP34 was introduced, but it has been deployed again to ensure that no Coinbase transactions have uh, uh, the same TXID. So that is what this question is about. I mean, why can't you just mitigate it by adding some other data or like? Uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, uh, I think yeah. I mean, this is so talked about. I don't think any miner would make this this foolish decision. You can do that, but it's it's like, what if the miner does not do? What happens then? What if the miner just mines? It's not mindful. It may yeah. be not case. Okay, I, like, would it be marked invalid or what not by the consensus? I don't, I'm not 100% sure, but yeah. But like, there are simpler ways to avoid this. Yes. I mean, like, BIP30 checks for the TXID of each and every transaction, right? So, if BIP30 in this block senses that this TXID already exists of an unspent uh, UTX, so like, how would BIP30 BIP react? Like, reject this coin based transaction or reject the earlier one? I mean, I'll have to like look into it. Okay. Cool. So yeah, we'll be scout through it and, and share our insights in probably Discord. What are hash functions used for in Bitcoin? Uh, basically, this just mentioned the list of cases where uh, hash functions are used and which hash functions are used. And most of us that have done like uh, programming Bitcoin uh, know what these hash functions are, where they use SHA-256, right? MD-160, SHA-1, SHA-256, double SHA-256. Start with 56 and write MD160 that's not hash 160. And uh, the answer just goes on to any list that what are the places where these hash, fun hash functions are, are used. So, like anybody who's more interested can just go to the answer. Uh, in five minutes, we just need to go through it quickly. So, as to not miss this, uh, LDK 265 has the ability to obtain blockchain data from an electric uh, style server. So, LDK basically is, is like a, a uh, what you can say a framework that uh, that allows you to build uh, to, to add a lightning wallet to a Bitcoin wallet. And uh, earlier, as per my research, they were referring to Blockstream, uh, Blockstream uh, server, which is uh, referred to as Explora server. And now they have added the facility to obtain the blockchain data from an Electrum style server. Uh, the next one is Lipsec P two fifty six K one number one four four six removes some X. 84 underscore 64 assembly code from the project switching to using existing C language code that has always been used for the platforms. The assembly code was human optimized several years ago to improve performance, but in the meantime, compilers improved in recent versions of both GCC and LLVM Clang now produce even more uh, performant code. So, Lipsec 
T256K1. It's, it's basically a key language a library that performs a lot of uh, uh, cryptogra cryptographic operations pertaining to Bitcoin. So uh, what it has done in its latest version is that uh, this X8664, this signifies that this library is uh, directed towards 64-bit systems and it uh, uh, leverages the features of a 64-bit system. So uh, some handwritten code is now being removed, which is redundant because the modern day compilers can uh, uh, deploy machine code to execute the same tasks. So some handwritten code was removed from the latest update of libsec p 256 k one library. Now BTC pay server is basically uh, uh, like they facilitate peer-to-peer uh, -peer Bitcoin transactions without uh, any intermediary fees or without any intermediary in itself. Uh, they just uh, use the, the network fee. And what they've done is that they've added support to secure multi-sig wallet setup, uh, like under the pretext of DIP 129. And they earlier used to refer to Bitcoin code for estimating fees, but now they've noticed that uh, there's a latency and also the, there's a lack of precision in Bitcoin code. So what they've done is they've shifted to mempool.space, all of us know what mempool.space is. And now they're referring to mempool.space to refer to what uh, uh, the predicted uh, or the estimated fee of a transaction would be for all the users of BTC Pay. So this is what uh, we had to cover. We are at the end of it. So if uh, there are there's anything that anybody would like to share, any insights, any anecdotes, something, then maybe we can do it quickly. And so we're done for the day. Great job, Fazil. There. Uh, so yeah, that this was your first uh, Bitcoin tech coverage of the week. And I hope to see more, many more from you. So yeah, great job there. I I had Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to see if other folks had seen that uh, brawl on Twitter wherein people were discussing about the possibility of a backdoor, and like uh, on on Twitter, and there was some discussion on it. I didn't get the time to catch up on it, but if someone has any information and they they can share, that would be great. There's I noticed. Like, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, they they were just shit posting. There's no backdoor. Oh, all right. Good to know. Basil, you you had something to share? I was just gonna say that I I uh, saw people posting about it in Vichal. I don't use Twitter that much, so I don't know. But yeah, I was just reading. So somebody posted some backdoor or something. So I was just saying my only uh, information is what was posted on Vichal. I did not even open the link, so yeah, I'm all kind of uh, cleared it. That, yeah, Save shit the day. posting. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Anwar. Cool. Uh, uh, I, I don't have any other questions, but Mango Elephant, Shayan, Stat, if you guys have any. Uh, hey, can you hear me? Yeah, Stat. Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is, uh, yeah. Like, uh, this is a tweet regarding the lip safety thing. I don't know if it's interesting. Uh, like I saw a tweet regarding the LipSec via the x86-64. It might be relevant uh, linked to the discussion. So just wanted to share that. If you can share it in the chat or maybe share the screen, we can we can all see that. Yeah, yeah, I'll share it in the chat. Yeah, I was I was going to look into the assembly code that that uh, they removed. Yeah. Okay, this, this is that we discussed about. Um, yeah, the LipSec yeah. thing. So you you sharing some information regarding this, right? Yeah, I sh I shared a tweet in the uh, chat, in the lounge chat. Okay. Finally, go to it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the the right person and the most relevant person. I because because I cannot. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the screen. I wasn't aware that that you are there. So yeah, right time, right place, right person to share the relevant link. Yeah, nice. Okay. And can, uh, yeah. Uh, if if you have two more minutes, maybe maybe we can open that and have our audience and everyone see that tweet. So if you go to lounge okay. in the lounge on the top right, go to the top right, not right side. Yeah, I'm in the lounge. I'm in the lounge. Yeah, go, the where, uh, go where? Go where? You see two icons: chat, chat icon, and add icon. In the lounge, go move to the right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Chat. That's the chat. Open chat. Yeah. Click on that. Yeah, that's the link. Cool.
should i open this github or or what to start this or would you like like just, so, just take us uh, through it in a few seconds yeah i just thought it was interesting that like that fact that signature verification that got 10% fact faster mm. okay and uh, yeah you can look into the pr but yeah i don't think it matters for us yeah okay so there will be 500 lines of code and this i mean what what uh, task these 500 lines of assembly code were performing how the compilers are performing these these uh, the same task without the need of these this assembly code right right sir yeah. yes mm. nice. it's weird it's a library which used to write assembly code too like normally we would have just written c code but then the library had assembly code in it I was curious why it take fifteen years to change assembly code to C. Fifteen years. I mean, when was it updated? Because it took a lot of time, right? So why did we need to wait till twenty twenty three? Yeah, is there uh, any reason? I think people. It's open source. People just noticed it now. And right. also, uh, the libsec library isn't that old. Like we used to actually uh, take open SSL's library. before uh the libsec p right now it's peter ulas uh pet project he did like he just thought if we could do more optimizations compared to open ssls and he just did it and he found that it just worked so much faster for bitcoin and uh, it's only very recently that we uh like maybe 6 7 years that we started using libsec p hmm. uh, as a mainstream library for bitcoin code I'd have to check. I'll check and tell you. Yeah, I think like he wrote it in 2017. 2017. Yep. Hmm. Okay. Excellent. As far as like we were talking about it a long time ago, and like yeah, I think he wrote it in 2017. Cool. Then if uh, like everybody is is fine, should we wind up the session or? Yep. Great job, Hazel. Okay. It, it thank, you so much. Yeah, and thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. And I just have uh, something to share. Share like firstly, thanks a lot to all of you uh, showing up on a Sunday evening and uh, encouraging me. And uh, all of you, each person who's here, like uh, I might miss out some names. Say to Anmo, Sharif, for Shreya, Mango Elephant, uh, Jatin, somebody that I might have missed because I'm not looking at the screen. Whatever feedback, suggestions you all have, please uh, feel free to shoot towards me. How I can get better? How I can make the session more interactive what I, what kind of research should i do for though that will help me make the sessions more interactive and and make the participants leverage more value from it and uh, feel free to dm me on discord anything that you notice or any any suggestions any advice please it's, it's more than welcome all right yep this was amazing yeah. thank you so much guys thank yeah. you thank you so much guys thank you thanks guys yeah. good night good night take care bye